Mr. Bookman here. Before I go ahead and start today's audiobook, do me one small favor. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel. And if you like today's book, make sure you do give it a thumbs up. Also, check out the comments for discussions. But more importantly, make sure you look in the description. You're going to see a link in there that's going to give you access to over 200 ebooks. Now, let's dive right into today's book. Three Detective Anecdotes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Charles Dickens' 200th Anniversary Collection, Volume 2. Three Detective Anecdotes from Reprinted Pieces by Charles Dickens. 1. The Pair of Gloves. It's a singular story, sir, said Inspector Weald of the Detective Police who, in company with Sergeants Daunton and Myth, paid us another twilight visit one July evening. And I've been thinking you might like to know it. It's concerning the murder of the young woman Eliza Grimwood some years ago over in the Waterloo Road. She was commonly called the Countess because of her handsome appearance and her proud way of carrying of herself, and when I saw the poor Countess— I had known her well to speak to, lying dead with her throat cut on the floor of her bedroom. You'll believe me that a variety of reflections, calculated to make a man rather low in his spirits, came into my head. That's neither here nor there. I went to the house the morning after the murder and examined the body, and made a general observation of the bedroom where it was. Turning down the pillow of the bed with my hand, I found underneath it a pair of gloves. A pair of gentlemen's dress gloves, very dirty, and inside the lining the letters T.R. and a cross. Well, sir, I took them gloves away, and I showed them to the magistrate over at Union Hall, before whom the case was. He says, wheeled, he says, there's no doubt this is a discovery that may lead to something very important. And what you have got to do, wheeled, is to find out the owner of these gloves. I was of the same opinion, of course, and I went at it immediately. I looked at the gloves pretty narrowly, and it was my opinion that they had been cleaned. There was a smell of sulphur and rosin about them, you know, which cleaned gloves usually have, more or less. I took them over to a friend of mine at Kennington who was in that line, and I put it to him. What do you say now? Have these gloves been cleaned? These gloves have been cleaned, says he. "'Have you any idea who cleaned them?' says I. "'Not at all,' says he. "'I've a very distinct idea who didn't clean them, and that's myself. "'But I'll tell you what, Wield, there ain't above eight or nine regular glove-cleaners in London. "'There were not at that time, it seems. "'And I think I can give you their addresses, and you may find out by that means who did clean them. "'Accordingly, he gave me the directions, and I went here and I went there, and I looked up this man, and I looked up that man. But though they all agreed that the gloves had been cleaned, I couldn't find the man, woman, or child that had cleaned that aforesaid pair of gloves. What with this person not being at home, and that person being expected home in the afternoon, and so forth, the inquiry took me three days. On the evening of the third day, coming over Waterloo Bridge from the Surrey side of the river, quite beat and very much vexed and disappointed, I thought I'd have a shilling's worth of entertainment at the Lyceum Theatre to freshen myself up. So I went into the pit at half price, and I sat myself down next to a very quiet, modest sort of young man. Seeing I was a stranger, which I thought it just as well to appear to be, he told me the names of the actors on the stage, and we got into conversation. When the play was over, we came out together, and I said, We've been very companionable and agreeable, and perhaps you wouldn't object to a drain. Well, you're very good, says he. I shouldn't object to a drain. Accordingly, we went to a public house near the theatre, sat ourselves down in a quiet room upstairs on the first floor, and called for a pint of half and half apiece and a pipe. Well, sir, we put our pipes aboard, and we drank our half and half, and sat a-talking very sociably, when the young man says, You must excuse me stopping very long, he says, because I'm forced to go home in good time. I must be at work all night. 
at work all night says i you ain't a baker no he says laughing i ain't a baker i thought not says i you haven't the looks of a baker no says he i'm a glove cleaner i never was more astonished in my life than when i heard them words come out of his lips you're a glove cleaner are you says i yes he says i am then perhaps says i taking the gloves out of my pocket you can tell me who cleaned this pair of gloves it's a rum story i says i was dining over at lambeth the other day at a free and easy quite promiscuous with a public company when some gentleman he left these gloves behind him another gentleman and me you see we laid a wager of a sovereign that i couldn't find out who they belonged to i've spent as much as seven shillings already in trying to discover but if you could help me i'd stand another seven and welcome you see there's t r and a cross inside i see he says bless you i know these gloves very well i've seen dozens of pairs belonging to the same party no says i yes says he then you know who cleaned em says i rather so says he my father cleaned em where does your father live says i just round the corner says the young man near exeter street here he'll tell you who they belong to directly would you come round with me now says i certainly says he but you needn't tell my father that you found me at the play you know because he mightn't like it all right we went round to the place and there we found an old man in a white apron with two or three daughters all rubbing and cleaning away at lots of gloves in a front parlour oh father says the young man here's a person been and made a bet about the ownership of a pair of gloves and i've told him you can settle it good evening sir says i to the old gentleman here's the gloves your son speaks of letters t r you see and a cross oh yes he says i know these gloves very well i've cleaned dozens of pairs of em they belong to mr trinkle the great upholsterer in cheapside did you get em from mr trinkle direct says i if you'll excuse my asking the question no says he mr trinkle always sends em to mr fibbs's the haberdasher's opposite his shop and the haberdasher sends em to me perhaps you wouldn't object to a drain says i not in the least says he so i took the old gentleman out and had a little more talk with him and his son over a glass and we parted excellent friends this was late on a saturday night first thing on monday morning i went to the haberdasher's shop opposite mr trinkle's the great upholsterers in cheapside mr fibbs in the way my name is fibbs oh i believe you sent this pair of gloves to be cleaned yes i did for young mr trinkle over the way there he is in the shop oh that's him in the shop is it him in the green coat the same individual well mr fibbs this is an unpleasant affair but the fact is i am inspector weald of the detective police and i found these gloves under the pillow of the young woman that was murdered the other day over in the waterloo road good heaven says he he's a most respectable young man and if his father was to hear of it it would be the ruin of him i'm very sorry for it says i but i must take him into custody good heaven says mr fibbs again can nothing be done nothing says i will you allow me to call him over here says he that his father may not see it done i don't object to that says i but unfortunately mr fibbs i can't allow of any communication between you if any was attempted i should have to interfere directly perhaps you'll beckon him over here mr fibbs went to the door and beckoned and the young fellow came across the street directly a smart brisk young fellow good morning sir says i good morning sir says he would you allow me to inquire sir says i 
"'If you ever had any acquaintance for the party of the name of Grimwood?' "'Grimwood, Grimwood,' says he. "'No.' "'You know the Waterloo Road?' "'Ah, of course I know the Waterloo Road. "'Happened to have heard of a young woman being murdered there?' "'Yes, I read it in the paper, and very sorry I was to read it. "'Here's a pair of gloves belonging to you that I found under her pillow the morning afterwards. "'He was in a dreadful state, sir, a dreadful state. "'Mr. Weald, he says, "'pon my solemn oath I never was there. "'I never so much as saw her to my knowledge in my life.' "'I am very sorry,' says I. "'To tell you the truth, I don't think you are the murderer, "'but I must take you to Union Hall in a cab. "'However, I think it's a case of that sort "'that at present, at all events, "'the magistrate will hear it in private.' "'A private examination took place, "'and then it came out that this young man "'was acquainted with a cousin of the unfortunate Eliza Grimwood, "'and that calling to see this cousin a day or two before the murder, he left these gloves upon the table. Who should come in shortly afterwards but Eliza Grimwood? Whose gloves are these? she says, taking them up. Those are Mr. Trinkle's gloves, says her cousin. Oh, says she, they are very dirty and of no use to him, I am sure. I shall take him away for my girl to clean the stoves with. And she put them in her pocket. The girl had used them to clean the stoves, and, I have no doubt, had left them lying on the bedroom mantelpiece or on the drawers or somewhere, and her mistress, looking round to see that the room was tidy, had caught them up and put them under the pillow where I found them. That's the story, sir. 2. The Artful Touch One of the most beautiful things that ever was done, perhaps, said Inspector Weald, emphasising the adjective as preparing us to expect dexterity or ingenuity rather than strong interest, was a move of Sergeant Witcham's. It was a lovely idea. Witcham and me were down at Epsom one derby day, waiting at the station for the swell mob. As I mentioned when we were talking about these things before, we are ready at the station when there's races or an agricultural show or a chancellor sworn in for an university or jenny lind or anything of that sort and as the swell mob come down we send em back again by the next train but some of the swell mob on the occasion of this derby that i refer to so far kidded us as to hire a horse and shay start away from london by whitechapel and miles round come into Epsom from the opposite direction, and go to work right and left on the course while we were waiting for him at the rail. That, however, ain't the point of what I'm going to tell you. While Witcham and me were waiting at the station, there comes up one Mr. Tat, a gentleman formerly in the public line, quite an amateur detective in his way, and very much respected. "'Hello, Charlie Weald,' he says. "'What are you doing here, on the lookout for some of your old friends?' "'Yes, the old move, Mr. Tat. "'Come along,' he says. "'You and Witcham, and have a glass of sherry.' "'We can't stir from the place,' says I, "'till the next train comes in, but after that we will with pleasure.' "'Mr. Tat waits, and the train comes in, "'and then Witcham and me go off with him to the hotel.' Mr. Tat, he's got up quite regardless of expense for the occasion, and in his shirt-front there's a beautiful diamond prop, cost him fifteen or twenty pound, a very handsome pin indeed. We drink our sherry at the bar, and have had our three or four glasses when Witcham cries suddenly, "'Look out, Mr. Weald, stand fast!' and a dash is made into the place by the swell mob, four of them, that have come down, as I tell you, and in a moment Mr. Tat's prop is gone. Witcham, he cuts them off at the door. I lay about me as hard as I can. Mr. Tat shows fight like a good un, and there we are, all down together, heads and heels knocking about on the floor of the bar. Perhaps you never see such a scene of confusion. However, we stick to our men, Mr. Tat being as good as any officer, and we take them all and carry them off to the station. The station's full of people who have been took on the course, 
and it's a precious piece of work to get em secured however we do it at last and we search em but nothing's found upon em and they're locked up and a pretty state of heat we are in by that time i assure you i was very blank over it myself to think that the prop had been passed away and i said to witcham when we had set em to rights and were cooling ourselves along with mr tatt we don't take much by this move anyway for nothing's found upon em and it's only the braggadocia after all what do you mean mr wield says witcham here's the diamond pin and in the palm of his hand there it was safe and sound why in the name of wonder says me and mr tatt in astonishment how did you come by that i'll tell you how i came by it says he i saw which of em took it and when we were all down on the floor together knocking about i just gave him a little touch on the back of his hand as i knew his pal would and he thought it was his pal and gave it me it was beautiful beautiful even that was hardly the best of the case for that chap was tried at the quarter sessions at guildford you know what quarter sessions are sir well if you'll believe me while them slow justices were looking over the acts of parliament to see what they could do to him i'm blowed if he didn't cut out of the dock before their faces he cut out of the dock sir then and there swam across a river and got up into a tree to dry himself in the tree he was took an old woman having seen him climb up and witcham's artful touch transported him three the sofa what young men will do sometimes to ruin themselves and break their friends hearts said sergeant daunton it's surprising i had a case at st blank's hospital which was of this sort a bad case indeed with a bad end the secretary and the house surgeon and the treasurer of st blank's hospital came to scotland yard to give information of numerous robberies having been committed on the students the students could leave nothing in the pockets of their greatcoats while the greatcoats were hanging at the hospital but it was almost certain to be stolen property of various descriptions was constantly being lost and the gentlemen were naturally uneasy about it and anxious for the credit of the institution that the thief or thieves should be discovered the case was entrusted to me and i went to the hospital now gentlemen said i after we had talked it over i understand this property is usually lost from one room yes they said it was i should wish if you please said i to see the room it was a good-sized bare room downstairs with a few tables and forms in it and a row of pegs all round for hats and coats and next gentlemen said i do you suspect anybody yes they said they did suspect somebody they were sorry to say they suspected one of the porters i should like said i to have that man pointed out to me and to have a little time to look after him he was pointed out and i looked after him and then i went back to the hospital and said now gentlemen it's not the porter he's unfortunately for himself a little too fond of drink but he's nothing worse my suspicion is that these robberies are committed by one of the students and if you'll put me a sofa into that room where the pegs are as there's no closet i think i shall be able to detect the thief i wish the sofa if you please to be covered with chintz or something of that sort so that i may lie on my chest underneath it without being seen the sofa was provided and next day at eleven o'clock before any of the students came i went there with those gentlemen to get underneath it it turned out to be one of those old-fashioned sofas with a great cross-beam at the bottom that would have broken my back in no time if i could ever have got below it we had quite a job to break all this away in the time however i fell to work and they fell to work and we broke it out and made a clear place for me i got under the sofa lay down on my chest took out my knife and made a convenient hole in the chintz to look through 
it was then settled between me and the gentleman that when the students were all up in the wards one of the gentlemen should come in and hang up a greatcoat on one of the pegs and that that greatcoat should have in one of the pockets a pocket-book containing marked money after i had been there some time the students began to drop into the room by ones and twos and threes and to talk about all sorts of things little thinking there was anybody under the sofa and then to go upstairs at last there came in one who remained until he was alone in the room by himself a tallish good-looking young man of one or two and twenty with a light whisker he went to a particular hat-peg took off a good hat that was hanging there tried it on hung his own hat in its place and hung that hat on another peg nearly opposite to me i then felt quite certain that he was the thief and would come back by and by when they were all upstairs the gentleman came in with the greatcoat i showed him where to hang it so that i might have a good view of it and he went away and i lay under the sofa on my chest for a couple of hours or so waiting at last the same young man came down he walked across the room whistling stopped and listened took another walk and whistled stopped again and listened then began to go regularly round the pegs feeling in the pockets of all the coats when he came to the great coat and felt the pocket-book he was so eager and so hurried that he broke the strap in tearing it open as he began to put the money in his pocket i crawled out from under the sofa and his eyes met mine my face as you may perceive is brown now but it was pale at that time my health not being good and looked as long as a horse's besides which there was a great draught of air from the door underneath the sofa and i had tied a handkerchief round my head so what i looked like altogether i don't know he turned blue literally blue when he saw me crawling out and i couldn't feel surprised at it i am an officer of the detective police said i and have been lying here since you first came in this morning i regret for the sake of yourself and your friends that you should have done what you have but this case is complete you have the pocket-book in your hand and the money upon you and i must take you into custody it was impossible to make out any case in his behalf and on his trial he pleaded guilty how or when he got the means i don't know but while he was awaiting his sentence he poisoned himself in newgate we inquired of this officer on the conclusion of the foregoing anecdote whether the time appeared long or short when he lay in that constrained position under the sofa why you see sir he replied if he hadn't come in the first time and i had not been quite sure he was the thief and would return the time would have seemed long but as it was i being dead certain of my man the time seemed pretty short end of three detective anecdotes mr bookman here i hope you enjoyed today's audiobook don't forget to subscribe, like the video, and go ahead and tell us what you thought about the book in the comments. But more importantly, don't forget to check out the description. It's got a link in there that's going to give you access to over 200 ebooks. And we'll see you next time. And remember, you are appreciated.